All right. Questions? theorem of arithmetic. The idea of, so any number n greater than or equal to 2 is either prime or obviously composite. But for the composites, what we're really saying is they can be written as a unique product of primes in non-decreasing order. Again, the whole idea of the non-decreasing order is only there just so that we can get the fact that uh, products are commutative, so I can rearrange it however I want. I don't want that sort of permutation. And so, yes, it's prime or composite, but composites are written as a unique product of primes in non-decreasing order, so everything's about primes. This has two core features. Um, it has this idea of can be written, which is the idea of existence that we would have to handle. And the second feature is unique, which is obviously uniqueness. So there's two parts of this that we would have to handle in particular. Um, to be able to show, we would need to show both of those. So if I would want to have some sort of proof of this particular theorem, the first thing you would want to show is existence, which we can't do yet. We're going to have to do this later because we're going to need induction to be able to prove this. We haven't done the technique of induction yet for proofs. So that's going to have to wait for a little bit. But we can go ahead and move on to the idea of a unique, if I did have a product of primes, it's kind of one of the things that you always have to worry about with the idea of existence is if you say, oh, let's assume existence and move on and do all these nice, wonderful things. Uh, one of the kind of a classic uh, problem with that was one of the professors was talking about, you know, a student when he was a student who was going through and he was studying a form of algebra and had gone through and says, well, if it has these, you have all these properties and he showed all these features and he did all these wonderful things about what this thing could possibly do. Is it, you know, if we're going to go through it, does it have this particular operator? And if it had this operator, what would we all have? And then finally, you know, his uh, PhD advisor said, well, what do these objects look like? You know, what, you know, how many do you have? What are they? And so you sit down and did all this work, and it ends up that there are none. So what he did is he found all the properties of the empty set. None of them existed. And so it's like, well, that's pretty well known. So he's like, oh, wait, they don't exist. It's impossible for them to be that way. And so, oh, look, all the properties of, of a set that contains nothing in it has all these nice features. Yeah, that, that's pretty well known. And... Existence, normally you have to think about and show, but we have that, but that's going to be needing a, an additional technique. Um, we're going to go on to uniqueness. And to be able to prove uniqueness, we're going to need a lemma. That you're not going to have to prove, you're just going to have as, I'm not going to require you to prove it. The lemma is P is prime. P divides a product of a lot of objects, say A1, A2, up to AN. So if P is a divisor of a product of a lot of factors, what that's telling you is that P should be able to divide one of these for some I. 
So if I have a prime dividing a multiplication of five objects, that prime is going to divide maybe one or more, you know, for some, one or more of those objects, if we would take it out as a factor. All right, how we use this lemma, and the idea would be for uniqueness for the fundamental theorem would be by contradiction. For uniqueness, so this is simply known. Unlike the square root of two proof where I make you prove it, this one you could just assume that you know this by contradiction. So we are going to assume, say N has two prime factorizations. What I'm assuming is non-unique, right? I'm assuming non-uniqueness. I'm assuming that, okay, unique means you have one way of doing it. I'm going to assume that I have non-uniqueness, that I actually have two. And so that would say that n is going to be equal to, on this side, we would have prime factorization number one. And on this side, we would have prime factorization number two. Is everybody okay with that? that n has these two prime factorizations. All right, the first thing, and since they're, they're non, the idea is that they're different, I have two prime factorizations, one of the things I would have to first worry about, and I'm going to do step one, I'm just simply going to cancel any primes that they have in common. Is everybody okay if I had a bunch of primes on the left and a bunch of primes on the right and they're equal to each other, I could just start crossing out any that are, that are the same. If there's a 2 on the left and the 2 on the right, throw the 2 away. It'll still be equal. If there's an 11 on the left and there's an 11 on the right, cross them out. It'll still be equal. So let's cancel any of the common prime factors. If I do that, what's going to happen is what will be left over would be on the left, some sort of prime 1, prime 2, up to, say, prime k. On the right, I would have some sort of prime 1, prime 2, up to, say, prime l, right? Where these are all, all primes. These are all primes, right? But by canceling everything in common, not only are there primes on the left and there's primes on the right, and they have no common primes. Does that make sense? I had a prime factorization throughout anything that they shared. They're still going to be equal. And I'll have primes on the left and primes on the right. And there are no common primes. They've been erased. All that's left is a bunch of primes on the left that are unique and a bunch of primes on the right that are unique. Is everybody okay with that? Now, the book, when they do this, you know, kind of renumbers it. For the, I just say that there's a prime factorization. They write it as prime 1, prime 2 up to prime n. The right side is q1, q2 up to qm. We cancel, and then you have to then use a double index notation <laughs> to say which primes are still shared. Okay, q11, and q12 up to q1k, and p11, p you have to have some sort of double index. But I'm pretty sure everybody understands that a prime factorization is literally a prime factorization. And let's go ahead and get rid of anything in common, because what I want is this point. I want to have a bunch of unique primes on the left equal to a bunch of unique primes on the right. Now, what we have now is we can do step two, which is to simply use our lemma. Right? What do I know? Well, if I look at the left hand side, 
obviously P1 must divide P1 times P2 times everything up to PK. Is that true? That, is P1 one of the factors on the right? Yeah. But what is P1? But that implies that P1 must also divide what? Well, what is P1 to PK actually equal to? Q1 to whatever QL is, right? Those. So that tells me that, okay, Q1 times Q2 times everything up to QL. Why? Because they're equal. If the right-hand sides are equal, I can replace things with what they're equal. But that, by the lemma, but that implies, so by lemma, that implies that P1 must divide a QI. But, and we know P1 is not QI. Why? Because of that whole, I already canceled everything in common. Nothing on the left is on the right. Is that possible? Can one prime divide another prime if they're different from each other? No. And so, but this together is logically false. So that tells us prime factorization is unique. If you indeed have a prime factorization, it must be unique. Because it's, if it's not, it leads to a contradiction. So it must be unique. Is everybody okay with that? All right. So that's the last part of things that we were supposed to be able to do for the beginning of number theory. So. For number theory, we need to be able to do things like divisibility, um, you know, the idea of 4.1, 4.2, and 4.3, and going through those particular problems, finding the primes, prove that there's an infinite number of primes, show, prove at least the uniqueness of the fundamental theorem of, of arithmetic. If I say something like fundamental, it should be important, right? We use it. So we should remember other things that everybody's gone through. What's the fundamental theorem of algebra? <coughs> Pretty quiet. What's the fundamental theorem of calculus? We usually say that there's two, but it's actually one in two parts. What does the fundamental theorem of calculus bring together? Anybody know? It brings together integration with evaluation, right? Antiderivative, right? Integration has, we talk about definite and indefinite, and we use the same symbology, this elongated S. Definite integrals are an area finder, right? That's not an actual, you know, the antiderivative. But the fundamental theorem says, wait, if you want to calculate the area, it's the same as calculating an antiderivative and evaluating it. Evaluate it at both sides of the interval, as long as it meets certain things. And so that's the fundamental theorem of calculus. We all should be able to take those two approaches. The fundamental theorem of algebra is simply that a polynomial of degree 5 is going to have how many roots? Five across the complex plane, right? And if you have complex numbers, they're going to occur in, if you have real valued coefficients, complex conjugates, right? You have an A plus BI, you're going to have an A minus BI. So they always occur in pairs. And so those are certain things that we just simply should know. This is as well. You can always do a prime factorization uniquely, or it's a prime. That's kind of one of the interesting things about the fundamental theorem, and we're going to use this here in a bit, about cryptography, is notice that because of the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, composites are equal to this whole unique prime product, right? So, for example, 6 is actually 2 times 3. So, if I would sit there and all the different variation of that we would take all of these things. And so, as we go through, primes are the only things that stay out. A composite is a number that inside of it, you could imagine nested inside of this, is the prime factors that generate it. And so, it's kind of an interesting number. 
that even though I tell you it's the number six, in your head you know, well, six is a composite. It's actually the things that matter are primes. Six is this different way of looking at two times three. And 12 would be two times two times three, right? Inside of every composite is hidden within its building blocks are these primes and these prime factors. And we're going to use that concept to do certain crypto problems. All right, applications. So we're going to jump straight to 4.6. I do recommend reading. For those that are going to do uh, actual number theory, read and try to do all the examples and try problems in 4.4 and 4.5 because that gets into doing uh, algebra-based problems. Like, this is congruent to this. How do I move the 3 to the other side? It better have an inverse under the modulus of the congruence. You would calculate the inverse, you would move it to the other side, and then you would solve congruence problems, right? It's basically doing things that you will do in a lot of number theory. All right, that's one application, right? It'd be integer-based algebra based upon congruence or equality. And then on, and they also have things like the Chinese remainder theorem, which would be necessary uh, applications of congruences like the hashing function. So if you're coding, what's a hash function? Well, that actually talks about the mathematics behind it. You ought to know and at least read for 4.4 four and 4.5. For us, the application that we're only going to do within this class is going to be crypto. All right, for cryptography. Cryptography in its simple function sense. As a function, what we're looking at is I have a set P, I have a set C, and I have a function F that goes across. F is a bijection, which means it's one-to-one -one and onto. Because it is one-to-one -one and onto, that tells me I come backwards as an inverse function. It exists, right? And the normal way that we look at these, F is going to map objects out of P into objects in C. So this is a mapping that's invertible. Normally we would denote the P as what's called a plain text set. C would denote the cipher or encrypted set. So I have sets of objects that are going to go from one to the other. And the way we normally write this, so if little p is an element of p, little c is an element of c, what we're saying is f of p is c and f inverse of c is p. f of p is c is, as a technique, is called, this is encryption. And this is decryption. Pretty easy. A string of little p's, like p1, p2, is an encrypt is a plain text string. A string of little c's is a encrypted string. And so normally what we would do is typically in application. We would do P1, P2, P3, up to Pn, and then each one individually will go across the function forming C1, C2, C3, up to Cn. And there's some variance of the ways that you actually do this sort of work. Uh, but typically, what we're talking about is F of P sub i is C sub i, and F inverse of C sub i is P sub i. We tend to go from string back and just simply go one at a time. Not all things actually do that, but 
most of the ones we do, except for one. We'll talk about a block cipher where it's not element to element. It's actually block to block, and it behaves a little bit differently. All right. In other words, this happens, but I don't do the entire string. I do a block of the string at a time, and then move on to the next block and use a cipher in a particular way. All right. One of the big you know, kind of fun ways of looking at things like this is how do these actually work? There's kind of two ways of handling P's and C. The first way that we would handle this is that P, C are sets of ideas, say, or an entire word. So, for example, I could say that P sub I is equal to happy. And then C sub I is going to be equal to, well, where am I going to map happy to? So I'm, I'm going to take the entire word happy, which is a concept, it's an idea, the word blue. All right, things that do this and idea to idea mapping are things like language. Right? So we pick everything that everybody knows. Knows enough Spanish to know colors. Red. What's red move to? I don't even know how to spell it. Is it R O J O? Right? Rojo? And so human language does this. And this was used to great effect in World War II. Anybody heard the code talkers? Navajo. Yeah, Navajo. But it was a variant of Navajo. They took Navajo and then they kind of tweaked things out. They, words took on different meanings on purpose, but they spoke Navajo. And it's like, well, the nice thing about having things like this, so this example would be, you know, the idea of a human language. And so as long as somebody doesn't know the language, Decryption requires what? Knowing the language. And if you don't have somebody that, you know, if you don't know the language, you don't have the ability to study the language enough to figure out what it is, right? They don't speak it enough in long conversations where you sit there and watch and see what people do and try to write down what the sounds mean, right? You could try to build up a process where if they keep speaking a human language, you'd be able to decode it. Okay, we do things like that. We even can do things like that with the dead languages, right? It just requires usually a Rosetta Stone of some sort, some sort of commonality that's going on that we could actually take it and figure out the process that's going on. And you'd go through it and say, all right, classic human languages. And so you can go around and play with things like, okay, you know, what would I do here? Say, happy. In Catalan, right? And that would be like that. I'm going to just pick a different one. There we go. Chinese traditional. There we go. <laughs> right? And so if we're going with these, you know, happy is now blocked out to idea symbols. And that's one of the things that happens on human language. Certain human languages, and that's when you look in the past and you say, how would I know if a human language is encoding their language in written form, in idea form, like this, or in sound form, right? Sound form does things like, not only do you pick it, you have to sound it out. So if I would go to German, not only is that a German word in a German block, it's not a single symbol. And so one of the other things that you would do is simply say things like, okay, what's going on? It's kind of a double level of encryption. We're using symbols to symbols as well as word to word. Now, if you just speak it, it's an idea block, the words that you say. Right? And so we would just simply go back and forth between the two. Um, if you're ever interested in things like that, if you ever want to figure out if a, a language is encoding the sound of the word, we all agree that the word red is red, right? That R-E-D recreates the word red as I say it. That's an encoding of the sounds. You only need a few dozen symbols to encode sounds. Right? You don't need a lot. And on the other hand, if you encode ideas, all right, you're going to need several thousand. I think to be considered literate in idea languages, you need like three to four, five thousand symbols known. Right? But on the other hand, we do, because 
that doesn't look like an ED, right? But your brain filled in the block. I can misspell things, and you already know what the word is. Right? Because as you read enough, you no longer go, rrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
computationally provably hard. from that function. It's kind of important. All right, why is public key important? Because every one of you talk to your bank on the internet, right? All right, I'm connected Wi-Fi, you're probably connected Wi-Fi, cell towers, you know, we have all these forms of technique. Well, guess what? The system administrator of the network has all of your packets. Period. So at the beginning, when you log into your, your bank, you know, you're going to log into their website, did you go to the bank, get a private key one-on-one -on -one from that bank that you both keep secret, then go home and you plug that into your browser so that you can make it secure? Of course not. What did you do? Hey, I need to talk to you securely. Okay, here you go. Everybody in the middle just did what? They have it. They know exactly what encryption technique you're using. They know exactly how it's happening. And they know exactly all of the codes and numbers necessary to encrypt. They have all of it. Not only do they have that, they have the entire message that you're sending back. So this would be like this. Not only do you know that it's a passenger pigeon, you know it's that passenger pigeon. And I have a copy of what's on that passenger pigeon. That's exactly the way crypto works over the internet. The bad guys have your message. They have what you use to encode your message. And everything in terms of the communications in between. How do I guarantee it's still secure? Well, what we do is public keys have within them what these basically use. The idea here is if, say, the number six is the heart of F. I use the number six as the heart of F to actually have this. Somehow the number six is special. But to decrypt, I need to know that 6 is actually 2 times 3. That these here are what should be private. All of your internet safety is based upon this idea. If the number 6 is the heart of your crypto, what's truly happening is I give the person my private key. I give everybody, the bad guys, my private key. But my private key is nested inside of the number six. My hope is I can't, they can't realize that six is actually two times three. <laughs> Which is obviously, they're not stupid, don't pick the number six. So what do we do? We don't pick the number six. We pick a private key that is a very large prime times a very large prime, and then I hand that off to the person, which is a very large, essentially a very large prime, squared. And they have to be able to do what? They have to be able to factor that. But factoring is computationally provably difficult because you have to test all the primes. So you pick it really huge so that there's a lot of primes to check. That's, you sit there and kind of think about it, that that there, that, that six is hard to factor, is what keeps you supposedly safe. But that also means you need to be able to find large primes randomly, provably randomly, so that they don't have to say, oh, wait a second, you're not going to pick those, I'm going to check these primes, because those aren't primes that you would ever possibly get. All right, so what are some private keys that we can do, at least, and so that's what we'll start off today. We'll talk about private keys, so some classic private keys. All right, the first one is simply shifts. All a shift does is, let's say that 
we make this, the plain text equal to the cipher. And so let's say my example is I use my entire language is A, B, C, D, E, F, G. That's my entire language. I just simply wrote it in a loop. So what I've done is the cardinality of P, cardinality of C is equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. I only have seven symbols in my language. So the only sounds I make are a, uh, b, c, which is, or k, d, e, f, and g. Good. Those are the only sounds I can make. And from those sounds, I'll make all words. Okay, that's fine. I'm only going to use seven words, seven sounds to do this. All right. Um, the way a shift cipher works is to simply go around the loop. If I would do, for example, a plus K, and so F of a plain text is to simply say, take my plain text and move it over K places. But how do I guarantee that if I'm a G, I'm supposed to go all the way, like if G is the number 7, right, and I add 3 to it, I go to 10. But there is no 10th symbol. How can I go back to the beginning? Mod 7, right? So the thing that loops things is modulus. So I start off with 0, and I go to 6, which is 7 symbols, but you can go 1 to 7, because 7 is actually what? 0, right? And as you do that, all I'd have to do is say, OK, let's just do a mod n, where the cardinality of these symbols is simply n. And then to invert it, we would take the ciphered symbol that you have, and we just simply undo it. If you added k, how do you undo an addition of k? Subtract k, and then mod n again. And so what we're doing, so if this was an example of k equal to 2, a would go to c, right? That's a plus 2. g would go to what? b. And so we can do things like, OK, what if my plain text string was dad. What does dad encode to as a plus two? D goes to F. A goes to so FCF is dad. How would I decode it? Go back to. If K is equal to three, this is called the Caesar shift. The book does things like, well, everything's mod 26. What are, they, what are they assuming? They're, we're assuming English, right? But what if I said, well, case, case matters, and that'd be up to 52. But what if I allow a space character? 53. How about the other symbols? How about, how about a comma and a period? And, right? You can take all of the symbols you want. Like if I would look at the book, and I would simply say, oh, I also want numbers, right? That's another 10. What if I want some grouping symbols? Left parenthesis, right parenthesis. All right, we got more. In the end, you can be whatever you want, right? All you're going to do is write all your symbols in order. Write zero as the first, one, two, three, count them all, and then just simply go through it and say plus whatever, modulo the size of your symbols. What you really did is just make a big circle and then go around the loop. Can you see that cryptanalysis is the idea that if I gave you the string FCF, could you figure out what word it was? It's like, well, if it was just FCF, maybe, but I probably could use some reasonable things. How many three-lettered words are there in the English alphabet? All right, and most likely the middle one is a what? Most likely a vowel. So I have two consonants surrounded by a vowel. All of a sudden you notice that my randomness starts to narrow. That middle vowel is maybe an I, maybe it's a did. You know, or, or things like that. But I also know everybody's moved at the same amount. So I start to look at all possible shifts, and then just with a reasonable group, shifts are incredibly easy to break. Honestly, you don't even have, as a, as a programmer, it's trivial. Because what would you do? Minus one, what did that become? Minus two, what did that become? Minus three, what did that become? Oh, I can read that one. I bet it's that. Right? You just simply subtract from the string. It's a trivial process. So that would only require how many loops? 
because there's only n unique numbers in modulus, because that's the remainders. So if it's like, oh, my symbol is there's 500 symbols, so what? It's a loop of 500. I've just got to look at 500 strings and pick the one I can read. I broke it. So it's very trivial to break. So that's, that's weak. Not even knowing that it's a shift, I mean, if you know it's a shift, hacking, cracking it is trivial. I don't even need to know what the shift is. There's only a few that I have to check. Make it a little more complicated. Affine shift. An affine shift says, I'm going to take the plain text and go through. First, I'm going to take the plain text number, multiply it by A, and then I'm going to add K before I do mod N. Again, the number of plain text is obviously the number of ciphers, which is always N. All right, so I took a symbol, first multiplied, second added. How do you undo that process? What would be the first thing that you would do? If you would subtract. So I take my cipher and minus k because that is the inverse of plus k, right? Now I multiply by a. How do I undo a multiplication? Does number theory have a divide? No, I need to multiply by a's inverse. So I'll write that as a's inverse. And then finally take mod n, where a, n ver a bar is a's inverse mod n. What are the only numbers that have an inverse? What must be true about a and n? That they are? They're relatively prime, right? If they are not relatively prime, inverses do not exist. So you don't get to pick any multiplier you want. You can pick any shift you want. K doesn't matter. You can pick any number you want. Again, there's only n unique numbers because we're taking mod n, so you can pick any, but you know, there's only actually n that matter. A, on the other hand, is restricted. A is pick any number that's relatively prime to n. The easiest way to do this is you just simply, if n is a number, find its prime factors, pick a different prime. Then they're going to be definitely relatively prime. That's typically what we do. So like, for example, if it's English and we use 26, what are the prime factors of 26? 2 and 13. So what should I pick for a? Pick some other prime. How about 3, 5, 7, 11? Pick any of those other primes, that's fine. That's an easy way to do it. So how do I do these processes? Well, again, on the other hand, this gets more complicated. But it does still move same symbols to same symbols. So I still could apply cryptanalysis. If you give me enough information, I should be able to tear it back apart and figure out where things went to, especially if it's a long enough text. Affine shifts are still within the, the next class of numbers, which is a random permutation. A random permutation is doing the, something like this. So let's say the cardinality of P is going to be, so P is the same as C. I have some symbols, so I have A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. And then what I do is I go through this and I just randomly reassign things. Everybody goes to a unique place. So I'm going to say things like, all right, um, my encryption function, if it's a shift, like plus two, everybody goes up two in terms of how it works. If it's an affine shift, it's still a shift, but it does it multiplicatively. It multiplies and then moves, and then multiplies and then <coughs> moves. And, but it still tells you there is a pattern to the shift. It's fixed. A random shift was, would be really just simply pick whatever you want. Okay, that's F. I'm going to make you an A. How about you a D and then an E? I'm going to make you a G. And then who's left? B? B and C? There we go. And so that's what I did. Just randomly move the letters. And then how do I decrypt? Right, and so for us, what would dad become? EFE, -E, and then backwards is still dad. 
Why? Because E goes to what? D, and F goes to A, right? Now, on the other hand, this is still sensitive to cryptanalysis. What you would do is you would look at things like, okay, you go through the entire thing and you would say, okay, what is the most common symbol in this person's language? Right? Then whatever I see occur the most times is probably E. Or better yet, if it actually has space characters, right? If you include the space character, spaces probably occur a lot more often than anything else, right? And you would simply say, oh, I bet that's the space character. And then what have you done? You've blocked out words. And then you know word sizes. And then you can start tearing it down by just simply knowing the human language. So it's still sensitive to cryptanalysis. All right. Uh, one that's easier to do and useful would be a block cipher. What a block cipher does is similar to a random permutation, but it doesn't do the entire string at once according to the symbols. What a block cipher does is go through a block and you pick a size. Say, for example, let's say size is equal to 5. Then what I do is I have my plain text block 3, 4, and 5, and then I have my cipher block 2, 3, 4, 5, and then I go through this and I say things like, okay, my first symbol is going to become my second, my second symbol is going to become my fourth, my third symbol becomes my first, my fourth symbol becomes my last, and my last symbol becomes my third. The normal way that you would write this is you would write something along the lines of this block cipher would normally be written as this guy goes to 2, this guy goes to 4, this guy goes to 1, this guy goes to 5, this guy goes to 3. It says 1 goes to 2, 2 goes to the 4th position, and then the 3rd position goes to 1. This is the go-to, right? That's the go-to position for encryption. And then how does it work? Well, if I would have this, mark was, I need some bigger spaces here. Mark space was space here. And then what I do is I go through here and I do it in blocks of five symbols. One, two, three, four, five. So that space character is in it. One, two, three, four, five. So that's the next block and I'm going to need two more space characters. Space character, space character gets me another block of five. And then I go through this and do the go to position. All right? Where does M, which position does M go to? The second. Uh, then the second guy goes to, A goes to the, the fourth position. So that goes here. Three goes to the first, which is there. Uh, the fourth position goes to last which is there, and then that's my space character. Notice how it just simply did this. This goes here, that goes there, that goes there. Where'd my K go? Fourth goes to who? Last. Oh, that's a K. There we go. He goes there, he goes there. Okay, where does W go? Two, and so... Another way to look at this would be the third number is S. The second position came from the first. W, the third position came from the last, which is the H. The fourth position came from the second, which is A. And the last position came from the fourth, which is a blank. So I'll write little blanks right there so we're all okay with that. And then let's and then the first position came from the third spot, which is E. The second position came from the first, which is E. The third position came from the last, which is a space. The fourth position came from the second, which is an R. And the last came from the second, which is the space. And so mark was here has now been encoded. R, M, space, A, K, S, W, H, A, space, E, E, space, R, space. That's Mark was here. 
What's nice about block ciphers is if you get really quick at, all right, second, third, like right, you just simply look at a block and you just rearrange it. It's, you just keep doing the same thing over and over again. It's also not as sensitive to the idea of, you know, you go through it. It's just a mixing of the words as you do it so you can make a mistake, but the next block will, will start off on its own, right? And so you can mess up one of the middle words and it won't be the killer. Yep. Is that like the one that we do in the So like some of them, I mean, it, there's a lot. I mean, but they do a lot of block ciphers, yes. It depends. All right, attendance. How about example six? With, and they're using a, that's called transposition cipher. It's a block cipher. With, instead of pirate attacks, um, math is... Awesome. All right, there we go. Encode that using, for example, six. All right, that's it. Mm -hmm.